What's up, everybody? We're LA Comedy Group, Obama's Other Daughters. And on our podcast, You Down, we're discussing what's going on in the culture. Everything from dating to therapy. Look, y'all, I got dumps on FaceTime, so Ooh. I had to hold it together. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what? So come kiki with us and join the kinds of candid conversations you only have with your girls. Listen to You Down on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. How do the world's greatest entrepreneurs find their way to such prominent positions of success? I'm Jeff Rosenthal, and in Art of the Hustle, my podcast from iHeartRadio, I sit down to chat with the cultural innovators and magnates shaping our future. From the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement to the former CEO of Twitter, join us each week as we discuss the insights and critical advice that shaped all of their lives. Listen to The Art of the Hustle on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Monster, DC Sniper, a production of iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent those of iHeartMedia, Tenderfoot TV, or their employees. Listener discretion is advised. Mildred, you let me know when we're rolling. And Hi, lady. Hi. Uh, I know it, it won't be easy. Um, what won't be easy? Talking about some of this stuff. It'll be easy. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> really? It may not be easy for you. To hear it? <laughs> for you. Is that because you processed it? Or? I'm done. What does that mean you're done? It means I do not have an emotional charge to this story. You may have one. Other people may have one, but I don't. How long do you expect me to hold on to that kind of pain? It's been 2002. We're in 2019. Am I still supposed to be crying? Am I still supposed to feel some type of emotions towards him? Some people think I'm still supposed to love him and forgive him. No, I'm not supposed to do that. That's your interpretation of what I'm supposed to do. And I have my interpretation of what I will do. I get to choose that. So the idea that I would think that this might be painful is a projection. Exactly. It's an assumption. You're basing your assumption on other people's or your own perspective of how you feel I should be with this story. That's not my reality. That's yours. So we're a minute in and she's already dropped the mic. (laughs) (laughs) She's already... (laughs) <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. No problem. Uh, thank you for that. I'm Tony Harris. On this special episode of Monster DC Sniper, I'm proud to present our interview with Mildred Muhammad. Mildred is a domestic violence awareness advocate and the ex wife of John Muhammad. John kidnapped her children, threatened her life. And many believe the D.C. sniper attacks were part of a plan to disguise her eventual murder. This interview covers topics we couldn't fit into the series. If you haven't listened to the whole season yet, it might be a good idea to finish the show first. All right, back to the interview. So could I have you state your name and your professional speaker's title? I am Mildred Muhammad. I'm an award-winning global keynote speaker. I'm a certified consultant with the Office on Victims of Crime. I'm a certified personal and professional development coach. And my former husband was John Allen Muhammad, whom you all know to be the D.C. sniper. I was laying on the sofa, and I was having this dream about women calling me, asking me for help, and they were just all around me, and I fell off the sofa. And I went to my children. I said, look, I got to help other women. And the only way I can do that is to share my story and yours about your dad. And I need your permission to do that. And they say, Mom, you do what you need to do. Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And so that's when I went to the library. I got a book on how to become a professional speaker. Decided to have the lotus flower as my logo because it was a flower that came out of the darkness into the light. I looked up domestic violence conferences on Google. I found two, contacted them, and I was able to land those two engagements. And I've been speaking ever since. 
When did you realize for yourself that you were in an abusive relationship? I was watching TV in Washington State, and there was a PSA. I understand that coming out of a domestic violence relationship is not easy. And it was a woman speaking, and she told of all of the signs associated with domestic violence. And as she's going through, I'm like, oh, okay, that's one. Oh, okay, that's two. Oh, wait, what? Oh. Well, I'll be. I'm in an abusive relationship. And I call the number. 1-800-799-SAFE. It's time for everyone to allow for their voices to be heard. And they talk to me. I'm in the room. My children are in the living room. John is at work. And they say, well, we'd like for you to come in. I say, nope, not coming in. They say, well, We really need to get you help. Nope. I just wanted to call to make sure that I'm seeing what I'm seeing and I need to come to terms with that and then I'll call you back. I never called them back. But at that point, that's when I knew. Because I just thought it was a part of a relationship. You know, that's how relationships are. I didn't grow up in an abusive home. So I didn't know that I was in an abusive relationship until I saw that commercial. And they don't even have PSAs anymore. They don't. Not even in the month of October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. There are no PSAs on TV. So that's when I knew. Most people don't really know that they're in abusive relationships. 80% of victims do not have physical scars to prove that they are victims. Although 20% do, I choose to concentrate on the 80%, the verbal, the psychological, the spiritual, the stalking. And it is my mission to shift the thinking of society to understand that you do not have to have physical scars to be a victim or a survivor of domestic violence. And because this is a worldwide epidemic, the person that you're sitting next to could be a victim or a survivor. It is how you have responded to this person as to whether or not they will confide in you and ask you for help. Before I left John, he came over and said, we need to talk. My brother was there, so I felt I was safe. We go in the garage. So he says, you are not going to raise my children by yourself. You have become my enemy. And as my enemy, I will kill you. He charges at me. I ran around him into the house where my brother was. And he leaves. And I tell my brother, I say, John's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He said, girl, John, I'm going to kill you. I never went to my brother again for help because he didn't believe me. And a victim does not have time to clarify to the people who she's going to for help how dangerous the situation is. He was hiding from everybody else, but I was the one that got to see it all. So when I go to people and say, you know, John is treating me in such and such a way, he's doing this to me. Well, that's not the John I know. Of course it's not. I tell victims of domestic violence, be careful who you talk to. Do the touch test. Touch test is Tony. John's just not treating me right. I mean, he is humiliating me and making me feel that I shouldn't even be here. And depending on his response is how I will either continue to talk to him or never speak to him again. Because he is going to put my life in jeopardy. He's going to go back and tell him, hey, man, you know, Mildred came in. Bam. So, no. That's the touch test. When he took the children, I stopped eating. I was eating a half a slice of bread and crushed ice. That was it. Just enough to sustain me. I was signing for a package from my mom on Mother's Day and I passed out. Get to the hospital and I had to have a blood transfusion. 
two people knew I was in the hospital. My phone rings, and it's John. He had people watching the house. And he says, how you doing? I said, I'm good. He said, how's mom? I said, she's fine. I said, why won't you let the children call me? He said, we don't always get what we want, do we? So there's a dialogue that goes on between the victim and the abuser, and only those two people know what that means. He had already said, you have become my enemy, and as my enemy, I will kill you. So I had two choices. I could go back to him and die, or I could hang up the phone and never see my children again. And I hung up the phone. I let out a scream. The nurses came. My mother called the hospital shortly thereafter and told them that John just called her and said he was on his way to the hospital to kill her daughter. So they moved me from one room to another, posted a guard outside my door, took my name off of the register and stated that anybody who was coming up to see me needed to send up their ID to identify whether or not it was John. A social worker came and said, you can't go back home. I said, well, my mom is at home. I said, we'll take care of your mom, but we have to disconnect from everybody that you know because we have to put you in hiding so that John will not find and kill you. So they waited till it got dark, took me out of the back door of the hospital. They told me I needed to slouch down in the car so no one could see that I was in the car. But I watched the rooftops and I was watching the open windows because I knew it was going to be a headshot. Just as sure as I'm sitting here talking to you, I knew it was going to be a headshot. I go into the shelter, and the staff person said, Millie, you're in luck. You get your own room. Like, I want to be in a shelter. So we go upstairs, and I'm sitting on the bed, and I'm thinking, how did I get here? Married for 12 years, three children, a business. I'm a businesswoman taking care of my mom, and I'm in a shelter? When a victim is still emotionally attached to her abuser, she or he, they are more concerned with what the abuser thinks instead of what they need to do to get away. Because even in the shelter, I was watching a commercial about a family and the husband, and that's when it clicked that John didn't love me. That's when it clicked. That's crazy. And that's when I had to swallow that pill that he didn't love me. After all of that, that was the moment. In the shelter. In the shelter, watching TV. Man, don't love me. (laughs) The light came on, so to speak. Was there anything in the commercial that triggered that? It it was a family setting. And it just clicked, just But once I swallowed that pill, it was on like popcorn. It was May 19th, 1983 in Springfield, Oregon. In the middle of an otherwise peaceful cool spring night, a car arrived at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital. Diane Downs and her three children had been shot. Cheryl, seven, was dead, and Danny, three, and Christy, eight, had life-threatening injuries. A year later, Diane herself was found guilty for the shootings. In the 80s, this was the shocking headline story of fatal attraction. Authorities believed Diane's infatuation with a married man, who said he had no interest in being a father to anyone's children, was the possible motive behind her shooting her three kids. One year later, at her trial, she was pregnant. 
That child was Becky Babcock. For years, Becky has tried to come to terms with who her mother is. But one mystery has haunted her. Who is her biological father? She's what I call a jackpot match. Did you find Becky's biological father? Join me as we search for the answer and explore Becky's and her mother's past on this season of Happy Face Presents Two-Face. Listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows. Blood on the Tracks is a new podcast about legendary music producer Phil Spector and the murder of Lana Clarkson. This podcast is hosted by me, Jake Brennan, creator and host of the award-winning music and true crime podcast, Disgraceland, and 27 Club. This new serialized podcast is part true crime, part historical fiction, and part spoken word lo-fi beat noir. Each episode is told from the perspective of the people who knew Phil Spector best, his so-called friends. Season one features 10 episodes and is released weekly. Episodes are packed with secrets, confessions, and revelations, and are narrated by the fictionalized voices of real people like Lenny Bruce, Ronnie Spector, Ike Turner, John Lennon, Debbie Harry, and more. Just like Phil Spector, this podcast sounds like nothing you've heard before, because you can't push the needle into the red without leaving a little blood on the tracks. Blood on the Tracks contains adult content and explicit language. Listen to Blood on the Tracks on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What knowledge did your children have of the difficulty you guys were having in your relationship? Were they aware of it? Children are always aware of a couple's issues. As much as we try to keep things from them, they know. September 2001, I gained custody of my children. We are trying to put our lives together. I did not interrogate them to inform me of what happened. We would watch TV and they would recognize, say, an island. And my daughter said, Mommy, we were in Antigua. Really? Yeah, there was a lady that we stayed with, and she asked us, why were we there? And I told her that my daddy took us from you, and then she told us we needed to leave. I say, really? Hmm. Okay. Anything else you want to share? Nope, that's it. The person that I had the most issues with was my son. Out of all three of them, I knew that John would turn him against me. He was jealous of our relationship. And he wanted to break him from being so attached and sensitive towards me. So I would ask him to take out the trash, and he would jump up off the sofa and come right in my face. You don't tell me what to do, boy. You need to back up. Don't you know I'm from Louisiana? Do you know we don't take this type of disrespect? You know what? Let me just take a pause and walk away from you. And so the girl said, John, why are you so disrespectful to mommy? You know you shouldn't be treating her like that. And I said again, take out the trash. He took it out reluctantly, but he did. So I'm sitting on the sofa journaling because journaling is therapeutic for me. Actually, I journal because I had no one else to talk to. People were judging me, victim blaming, telling me that everything was my fault. And John walks up and he says, you want to know what dad said about you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, okay. Dad said, you didn't want me. Dad said, you love the girls more than me. Dad said, you wanted him to take us because you wanted to live the rest of your life without us. I said, anything else he said? Yeah, he said a lot of things. I said, well, tell me the rest of it. No, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I said, I'm a big girl. I can take it. He said, no, Mom. I said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to compare what your dad said to what I do. 
if you find that I am doing something negative that he said to you, I want you to talk to me. I want you to tell me about it so that we can talk about it. You need to know why I do the things I do. And then you can come up with your own interpretation. Because the only way we're going to get through this is with the truth. And I will tell you the truth, even if it makes me look bad. But that's the only way we're going to get through this as a family and be stronger afterwards. Can you promise me you'll do that? He said, yes, ma'am, I can do that. I said, and by the way, what can I do? He said, mommy, if you could just spend time with me and talk to me, I think that will help. I said, when do you want to get started? Can we start today? Absolutely. Let's go for a walk and talk. And I had to tell him what happened. I used age-appropriate language. He was 11 to describe to him what happened and how we got to the point where we were. I'm thinking about possible issues. I don't know how many of these were present. I'm thinking about little John having questions, issues surrounding maybe betrayal, abandonment. They all had abandonment issues. I would go to work and I told them I would be back at 5 o'clock. I didn't show up until 5.15. I opened the door. They were hysterical. I said, okay, let me give myself some room. So I told them I will be home between 5.30 and 5.45. And I showed them on the clock what that looks like. But I always made sure I came home at about 5.15, 5.20 to give them a routine After we got all of that cleared up, then there were no more abandonment issues. I didn't find out about the conditions in Antigua until years later. I went to the Virgin Islands for a speaking engagement. One of the ladies was explaining to me the conditions in Antigua is as if you went back a hundred years. And I lost it. On a speaking engagement. <laughs> Just, I'm glad I was finished speaking because I, I was a mess. I took everything to hold myself together until I got home. And when I got home, my son came home and he said, Mom, this is what I want to tell you. They had to wipe themselves with leaves to use the bathroom. They had to carry painter buckets of water with worms in it back to wherever they were living and put a sheet up so that they could bathe. He said, Mom, we almost lost hope. And that just stabbed me in my heart when he said that. And I said, Honey, I'm just so sorry you went through that. I did not bring you in this world to suffer. And I, I've lost you guys for 18 months. And that's 18 months I can't get back. But I hope that since I've had you back, that I have done everything that I possibly can do to make you feel like you were home. And he said, Mom, you did that. You went over and above. We know everything you've done, and you've done a great job. You taught us that we have to go through our emotional breakthroughs and we're gonna give you time to do that. Just go through this process, go through this crying, and then once you're done with it, then we can keep going. When you speak, when you look out into the audience, describe who you see. I see individuals who have taken the time to come and hear my story, but also There are victims in the audience that are looking for something that would help them leave strategically without being hurt or killed. Because up to 75% of women who try to leave an abusive relationship are either hurt or killed. Share some of your, your knowledge on how do women leave? Everybody has a different way. Some leave abruptly. 
Some plan, some stay. I saw a stat that it takes women in abusive relationships up to seven attempts to ultimately leave for good. That is correct. But that speaks to how difficult it is to leave. It does. The short answer. The long answer is it wouldn't take me seven times to leave if I had support. It wouldn't take me seven times to leave if people didn't blame me for the abuse that I'm in. So I have to not only handle the abuse that I am in with my boyfriend or husband, but I also have to deal with his family who's coming after me, telling me not to report him or turn him over to the police. I have to look at my friends who are telling me that I'm stupid and I should get out, but nobody's offering me a way out. Nobody asks me what I want to do. You're too busy telling me what to do. But if you was in my shoes, what would you do? So don't give me medicine you won't take. Is there a story that you've heard or that comes to mind that demonstrates for you the key differences between violent abuse stories that we hear a lot about and verbal abuse stories that we don't pay as much attention to? I'll give you the case of Rihanna and Chris Brown. When it first came to light of the abuse, we only had her word. She told how he was hurting her. What do we do? We praise the abuser and we silence the victim. Why would you do that to Chris? He's a good man. Why are you saying these things about him? Then they started to bring up her past and how terrible of a person she was until those pictures hit the news. And then it flipped. He lost endorsements. People couldn't understand why he would do this to her. And whatever she did, it shouldn't warrant that. When it came out, my first instinct was she's calling out for help, but no one is listening. When the pictures came out, everybody listened. Why does it take a picture for you to understand? So what I would say to victims and survivors in the 80% who do not have physical scars, document, document, document time and date. Write it down as soon as it's fresh in your mind. If there are people there to witness, ask them to write affidavits so that you can help the police by building your case. Because the police only goes off of evidence. And if you have it written down, then you are actually building your case, which is evident that you are in an abusive relationship and you need help. And it goes the same way for men. Men, you know, y'all just summarize stuff because you feel you don't want to get the woman in trouble. And it's not until your backs are against the wall that you start to explain the physical assaults that you're going through. My dad passed when I was nine from a domestic violence situation. Not with my mom but with another woman. What happened? My mom and dad were separated, and he had decided to come back to my mom. The woman who he was with said no, and she waited until he was asleep. She padlocked the doors and the windows and set the house on fire. You're telling me your dad was killed in a domestic he violence... Was murdered. Murdered in a domestic violence situation. Mm-hmm. When I was nine years old. I found this out when I was 21. I went to my cousin's funeral. While we were at the repast, there was some men playing cards, and I heard them call my dad's name. And so I went over by the doorway, you know, just to listen. And they said, you could hear him screaming for miles. And no one could get close to the house because it was too hot. And so they waited until the fire department came to put the fire out. I said, Mom! You told us he died in the Navy, that he died on a ship. That's why they had his casket draped with the flag. She said, well, he was in the military. They gave him the flag because that's what they do with soldiers. But I was waiting for you to get old enough to tell you. But that's how my dad died.
You down with black hair? You down with abolishing the prison industrial complex? You down with puppies? Who isn't down with puppies? You'd be surprised. We're the comedy group Obama's Other Daughters, and we're inviting you to come kick it with us on our podcast called You Down. We're bringing you the same fun vibe we serve during our improv shows in LA, only in podcast form. Check in with us as we discuss everything going on in the culture and have the nerve to give our unexpert opinions to a lucky listener. Whether it's embarrassing hair stories or comedy fails, we might even talk about ghosts. <laughs> Listen to You Down on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You Down. What if you could learn from a hundred of the world's most inspiring women? Now you can. Introducing Seneca's 100 Women to Hear, a new podcast brought to you by Seneca Women and iHeartRadio. I'm Kim Azzarelli. In celebration of the 100th anniversary of American women getting the vote, we're bringing you the voices of 100 groundbreaking and history-making women. Listen to Seneca's 100 Women to Hear on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. How do you know what are the warning signs that you're in an abusive relationship and that it's not some quote-unquote tough love? Love is not tough. There are many signs to domestic abuse and violence. And I could go over the signs, and you can look them up on the computer. But I'm going to say it like this. It really depends on your tolerance for pain. It really depends on how you grew up. If you grew up in a household where you witnessed your father or your mother abusing the other parent, then your tolerance for pain is high. And so it wouldn't be much of a surprise if someone yelled at you, if someone tried to restrict you or something to that nature. There are many men who grew up in an abusive home, and there are many men who choose not to abuse when they are in relationships. So that tells you right there is a choice. You are making a conscious decision to control a life you did not create. So the question is, why do you feel entitled to control someone else's life when you don't have control of your own? Disappointments and frustrations are dealt with in different ways. But if you were not taught how to handle your frustrations and disappointments, then you will blame other people for bad decisions that you've made instead of holding yourself accountable for your own actions. Can you explain from your work with other victims and survivors the control dynamic in abusive relationships? Well, it's the honeymoon cycle. You know, I love you. Then you do something to, to make me hurt you. I'll call you out your name. I'll even physically assault you. Then I'll look at you and go, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'll never do this again. I go buy flowers or I go get your favorite perfume or whatever until you do something again. And then I beat you again. I never hold myself responsible for beating you. It's always your fault. It's always your fault. If you wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have had to do See what you made me do? No, that's a choice you made. Why is control required by these abusers? It must speak to lack within themselves. Absolutely, it's lack within themselves. They're insecure about their own life. Again, it goes back to the childhood and how you were raised in your home. If you didn't have anybody to talk to, to understand your emotions and how you process those emotions and you're watching TV instead of having a sit-down talk with an actual person in order to understand why am I feeling this way? It's got to be a reason. Absolutely, it's a reason. So we have to understand the, the emotions that are coming up are lessons that we need to learn for ourselves and understanding how to handle them. You may not know yourself how to do that, but go to a friend that you trust to help you to process those emotions. When you finish your talks, describe for me 
what you think and what you hope people get from your discussion of these issues. I never cry on stage. I never cry at a presentation. If there's a victim in the audience that's coming to see me, for me to cry on stage tells them that they will never get out. They look at me hoping I will say something that will help them not only to get out, but they can be strong, they can be strategic, they can put the tools in place and become healed like me. Crying tells them I'm not healed. Crying doesn't give them hope. Some people say, well, you know, it's okay to cry to show people how you feel. Not at that moment. Not at that moment. When you're done, go cry in your room. But don't cry in front of an audience that's looking to you for hope, for empowerment, and for the ability to know that once I get out of this, I'm going to be just like that. And I'm going to share my story, and I'm going to be strong and help other people. Is there a question that you get more often than any other? After I share my story, mostly what I get is, I'm so glad you're still alive. I'm so happy that I drove so many miles to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. I remember one when I was speaking in three different locations in Virginia. And it was this one woman that was at all three locations. And I saw her, (laughs) and she came up to me and she said, Hey, Miss Muhammad. I said, Hey, how you doing? She said, You know, I've been to all three of your presentations in Virginia. I said, Yeah, you're my little stalker, huh? (laughs) She said, Miss Muhammad, you're right. But I just had to hear you say this one statement because I never heard that before. I said, Well, what was that? She said, I never heard anybody say that you don't have to have physical scars. Miss Muhammad, I have been in an abusive relationship for 17 years, and he never hit me. I'm the breadwinner. He stays at home, and he terrorizes me and my children. The first time you said that, I went home. And I looked for it everywhere, and I couldn't find it on the Internet where anybody else said that. So I I had to make sure that I heard what you said. So I went to your second session, and you said it again. But this time, I applied what you said when you told us you may not realize you're in an abusive relationship. So go home, get a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, pros and cons, right? So you write down the pros, you write down the cons, but when you write them down, you don't make excuses. Like, he hit me because A, B, C, and D. No, he hit me. And you're only evaluating the relationship and not the individual because we change every day, right? So she said, I went home and I did that. And like you said, if the pros outweigh the cons, then we can work on the relationship. I said, but Miss Muhammad, the cons outweigh the pros. So that meant I needed to make a decision. But I just had to hear you say it one more time <laughs> before I made that decision. And when you said it again, I knew I had to leave. And so I left Miss Muhammad. And guess what? Me and my children, we are happy. And I would never have left if I didn't hear you say you don't have to have physical scars. What does hearing something like that do for you? That makes me feel that what I started to do, it's working. Because it's my mission to shift the thinking. And I shifted her thinking so that she can take a comprehensive look at her relationship and then strategize on how to effectively leave. And that's what she did. I want you to dig in a little bit more on that sheet of paper concept and what you're writing. So can you talk about that bit of guidance again, what you tell people to go home and do? Again, you may not know that you are in an abusive relationship. So get a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, pros on one side, cons on the other. Pros and cons of the relationship. Of the relationship only, not of the person. 
okay, because we all have flaws. We all come with bags. We just choose the person who's willing to deal with the stuff that's in my bag, right? So you got the pros and the cons on the paper. The next thing you need to do is separate your emotions from the actual facts, Just like Judge Judy, she says, what, all I want are the facts. I don't want no emotions. You want to be emotional? Go talk to Dr. Phil. So we only want the facts because the facts will help you to see who you're dealing with. A pro could be he put gas in the car because the tank was empty. No, he put gas in the car. doesn't matter the reason. There's no exception, no condition. He put gas in the car. A con would be, He disconnected my phone because he didn't want me on the house phone. No, no, no. He disconnected the phone. Simple as that. So once you come to the end of that, if the pros outweigh the cons, the relationship is worth analyzing and saving. And you have to create a new normal. You can't go back to what it was. You have to start fresh. If the cons outweigh the pros, you really have a decision to make. Are you going to stay in a relationship? A lot of people don't leave because they got a lot to lose. Or I helped to build that house. I put money in that account, too. I'm not having another person to come in here and enjoy the fruits of my labor. I mean, all of that stuff goes on. So that's a decision you have to make. And the decision is completely yours. You don't need outside people telling you what to do. Nobody's living your life for you but you. But make sure it's a decision that you can live with. If you suspect you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or go to thehotline.org. Once again, that's thehotline.org. Remember, you are not alone. Because domestic violence reports are on the rise, Mildred Muhammad also recently released an ebook called Being Abused While Teleworking During COVID-19. You can find it online. That's it for this bonus episode of Monster. We'll be back soon with another bonus episode, an interview with John and Mildred's daughters, Taliba and Selena. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. When you're coming from a position of being nine years old and all you've known is my dad acts this type of way because I'm a child, that when you see him on TV, it's like, well, I don't know what they're talking about because my dad was consistent was consistent yeah in consistent his love her, right yeah. and was doing all of these things that he was supposed to be doing in 1983 diane downs shot her three children killing one and severely injuring the others she showed up for her trial pregnant Now, nearly 40 years later, that child, Becky Babcock, is on a journey to explore her connection with her mother's violent past. Listen to Happy Face presents Two-Face on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows. How did the world's greatest entrepreneurs find their way to such prominent positions of success? I'm Jeff Rosenthal, and in Art of the Hustle, my podcast from iHeartRadio, I sit down to chat with the cultural innovators and magnates shaping our future. From the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement to the former CEO of Twitter, join us each week as we discuss the insights and critical advice that shaped all of their lives. Listen to the Art of the Hustle on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.